There we go. Uh, and I'm looking at it from the anatomic pathology um, side of our business within Lyca Biosystems. So to give you a little bit of background, Lyca Biosystems, people may have heard of Lyca and automatically think of cameras or microscopes. We all originally came from the, the one company and Lyca Biosystems are specifically focused in the healthcare industry. Um, we're part of the Danaher uh, Corporation and in the Life Science and Diagnostics Division. So when there have been a few talks about the level of diversity that people have in different companies, I think Danaher really epitomizes this, where, you know, where I come from it is very much in the healthcare and diagnostic side of things. Another division of the company um, generates and makes hand tools, so spanners, wrenches. Um, another section of the company, if you ever hear one of the huge, big, you know, multi-ton trucks trying to stop, and you hear that thump, 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 that's Jake Brakes in an awful lot of them, which is another part of Danaher. So really bringing all these very um, disparate technologies together, um, which I think is one of the reasons this meeting really appealed to me as well, it is looking at that. So looking at like a biosystems, we're very much a leader in anatomical pathology. Um, when people think of pathologists, often they think to kind of the autopsy side of things or straight towards a CSI um, type thing. But for the majority of pathologists, where they spend their day is actually looking at glass slides down a microscope. Um, so if you've ever been in the unfortunate position where you've discovered a lump or you've had to go for surgery. You'll go into your doctor or your GP, they'll assess it, take a biopsy, and then everything that happens to that piece of tissue until you have a diagnosis and you can have a, a treatment decision made, that's what like a biosystems do. Um, so really, when we look at, at healthcare and the healthcare industry, Pathology is one of the ones that is still very much a manual process. It's hands-on, there's limited levels of automation in it, and it really isn't entering the digital era. Although I'm going to cover a couple of things that really look at how we can drive pathology into the digital era, excuse me, and really looking at increasing automation and removing that source of human error that is absolutely inherent within pathology. And the two areas that I'm going to look at here are specific to sample tracking and then onto digital pathology, um, which our friends from Hamamatsu will know all about. So when you look at the typical anatomical pathology workflow, and I have to apologize because some of these are quite small, but really what happens is your sample is removed and it's put into a pot of fixative. At that point, it gets to the lab and that's accessioning. And this is really your first major source of error. It's can you associate that sample with the correct surgical procedure that it's being removed from and ultimately tie it back to the correct patient. And while it sounds quite simple, when you have thousands and thousands of these samples coming into a lab every day, this is a major source of error. It then moves on to another very manual process, which is the grossing or the cut up. Um, and this is literally where you take a lump of tissue and you have to section it and subsection it, like cutting a piece of meat in, I suppose, the crudest way to put it, in order to make sure that you're looking at the right piece of tissue within that sample to make your diagnosis. And this is literally done on a bench with either a pathologist or a scientist and a scalpel. So again, hugely manual. You then go through a number of processing steps because if, if anybody has tried to cut um, very thin meat sections, if you're carving it at dinner, meat, it is, it's quite difficult to cut. So part of the whole process, and excuse me for people who are scientists in the audience who are probably finding this um, a little basic, you have to go through a, a whole process of embedding wax into the actual tissue sample, which makes it rigid, and that makes it rigid enough so that you can cut very fine sections on this, about four microns thick. And once you have it at that thinness, it's optically clear, so you can then look at staining it and then look at the different biomarkers. And really, when you get to the end of this process, we're looking at making a diagnosis. 
Typically, this is still done down a microscope. And the idea here is that you're looking at that piece of tissue, you're looking at the morphology of it to see, are there normal cells there? Are there cancerous cells? Do you have some kind of a parasite present within the tissue? And then also looking at the expression of different biomarkers. And those biomarkers are going to really determine if it is a cancerous piece of tissue, what's the likelihood of that responding to a particular drug? What's the best treatment protocol for a patient? So as you come right the way through, there's about 10 or 15 hands-on pieces. And you'll see where the source of error arise. So right now, with the NHS, if you look at the, the LA annual report for the, the last year, there was over one point, well, about 1.2 billion paid out in um, clinical negligence expenditure. It's estimated that if the NHS right now had to settle all of their claims, it would cost 18 billion. And if you have a look at these slides here, these are patient samples. What does that say? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Okay, because it could be SOS 1405, it could be 50 s 1705, or coming all the way down 17 OS. If this is your sample in a lab, you want to make sure the person who's reading it knows what it says, because this is where misdiagnosis, it's one of the biggest sources of misdiagnosis. Same thing, and you'll see that when you actually bring the sample into the lab, as I mentioned, there's multiple hands-on steps where people handwrite these labels on a, a regular basis. So these would be the cassettes that you use when you're trying to infiltrate that wax so you can cut it. And then this is an example after the section has been cut from the wax block on how it locks. So as you can see, a huge source of potential error here. Case sorting, incredibly manual. This is how they actually get to the pathologist. And this is the most common method for slide delivery. Pop it in somebody's pigeonhole and hope that they know it's there. If you're waiting for an urgent diagnosis and somebody hasn't walked by their delivery box, you're waiting on that diagnosis. So this is an example from a Dublin hospital that really epitomizes it. I think it's very easy to distance yourself from, well, there are mistakes and there's human error and it's inherent in everything we do. But this is a case, as I say, from a, a Dublin hospital where two samples were mixed up. One was from a, a young guy in his early 20s. Um, and it, it showed that he had a very severe form of cancer. And as a result, he was diagnosed and the treatment uh, was surgery and it was full removal of his stomach. Now they removed this guy's stomach, which means he will never eat a meal again in his life. He'll never enjoy a beer. He'll never bring his girlfriend out for a drink. And it turns out they removed his stomach and it was completely healthy. There was a mix up of the samples in the lab. It's not in any way a unique case. This happens on a pretty regular basis. This is one from Wales actually where two people died after again, a cancer mix up with their tests based in the pathology lab. It's a pretty simple solution, but it does, it's disruptive because it involves changing the way things have been done pretty much for the last 150 years. And really, this is looking at standardization in your labeling and your sample tracking. So the obvious things, eliminate those transcription errors. Make sure that you have the visibility and tracking through every part of the process and every stage. So you can actually know where somebody's sample is in the lab. If you have an urgent case come in, you know exactly where it is and when the person can then get their diagnosis. It can provide consistency across multi-site deployments. Again, looking from the NHS perspective, where you're really looking at so many trusts coming together, multi-site hospitals, all with different processes, slightly different ways of doing things but standardization so that you can get the same standard of care and the same reliability throughout these multiple sites. And also enables automated integration with your laboratory information system. 
And this comes back to some of the topics touched on earlier about standardization in your communication protocols. So this is the alternative to handwriting and, and scribbling down. And hopefully that somebody in the lab has good handwriting where you use standard barcode readers and generate either your 1D or your 2D barcodes. And that completely dictates the whole workflow throughout the lab. So what it'll do is tell the person, OK, here's the sample. What process should this go through? Which slides need to be generated? And then that constant human readable and machine readable connection between all the different phases that your tissue goes through. Now, why, why would you, you bother? I think I've probably covered some of this. But it minimizes the potential for sample misidentification, leading to potential misdiagnosis. Um, we have a, a situation with a UK hospital who have adopted this um, in the last year or so. And they've managed to decrease their error rate from 0.25%, which was already relatively low, to less than 1%. So they've more than halved their potential risk for misdiagnosis within a couple of months of impl implementation. It records the processing of your sample and it increases that accountability. So you can like, quickly identify if you have weak spots and you can have your, your workflow data. Um, I'm going to speed up a little. Um, I think my, okay, I'll speed up a good bit then. Um, <laughs> you, you let an Irish girl speak. Come on. Um, so moving on to the next bit, which is digital pathology. So we've gone through the whole sample tracking and the creation of the sample. And then typically these are visualized down a microscope. But the limitation of that is your microscope, your sample, and your pathologist all need to be in the same place at the same time. So di when you look at digital pathology, we're looking at digitization of the glass slide into a high resolution image. And really, when I talk about high resolution, I'm talking up to 10 gigapixel for a single image. So to put that into context, that's like taking a photo of a football pitch and then being able to zoom in and look at the detail on every single individual blade of grass. So getting into the file sizes on their own, easily in excess of a gig, and we very quickly get into the petabyte range. So the vast majority of pathology is still done down a microscope. The future is looking at it reading on screens. So a truly disruptive technology. Um, benefits, and I'll, I'll look at these, anytime, anywhere access to your pathology expertise. So if anybody has ever had to have a second opinion, or you're looking to contact a, a subspecialist, if that subspecialist is halfway around the world, maybe they're based in the US, in New York, what would happen now traditionally is your sample gets packed up, it's a delicate glass slide, and it gets sent over with FedEx in the hope that it gets there and it doesn't break. And then the pathologist will eventually get it, and then they'll make a read. If you have a time-sensitive diagnosis, this can be hugely costly from a healthcare perspective. So when we look at this and how can you actually deploy it, and I'm happy to go into this with more detail if anybody wants to, you can do it on your local network. So we're talking about within an institute here and leverage your expertise, hub and spoke type deployments, which would be very typical for a hospital trust, or as we move kind of more into the digital age, really looking at those cloud-based deployments. Um, things to consider and things that we come up against every day as our challenges, you're only as fast as the network you're on. So network speed and connectivity can be a huge issue. It's something we actually come up against with some of the NHS uh, networks even at the moment. Security as well is a huge um, consideration because you want this data available but only to the correct people. And you're talking about protection of patient and personal health information. Um, the data transfer, and again, this comes back to how sustainable is this? So interoperability with other systems. So you can't have a specific system for every single use case within the hospital. I'm really looking at integrating this into your electronic patient record. 
Um, on top of this, you have conformance with industry standards. And these industry standards are not necessarily as cutting edge as the technology that um, is driving them. So to a certain extent, like you look at things like DICOM standards, which is the image format that would be typically used with PAC systems. The DICOM format, as it exists in the rules and regulations around it, don't actually support digital pathology. So there's an interpretation and there's a working group specifically working on this and have been for a number of years. Um, so it, it's that which, which piece can lead the other. The storage, again, coming into a similar thing, really very quickly get into the petabyte range. However, the archiving requirements that we have currently, again, not regulated or defined by any of the individual laws or governing bodies, and the retention for glass slides is over 25 years for most countries. We're looking at the same challenge with the digital slides and not necessarily at this point, again, from a regulation perspective, replacing the glass. But there are benefits, and this is my last slide, I promise. Um, greater access to remote pathology, leverage your subspecialist, be able to get that very specific diagnosis. Um, and in Europe, I, I can use the term diagnosis. You can do this in Europe under CE marking, not just yet in the US. Um, it removes a lot of the time consuming steps through automation and integration. And then looking at potential cost savings, and this is a recent one done by the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, if they were to move to full adoption. And really, the total five year savings of over 17 million US dollars potential. Bringing it back to something a little more local with um, a site that we have up in Scotland, in Aberdeen, they were able to maintain a critical service without a full-time pathologist by leveraging some of the pathologists in Edinburgh. So there's an impact both from a financial perspective for the individual health organizations, but also from a quality of care and standardization of care perspective uh, from the patients. So this is moving into the, the digital and I won't ask for questions. <laughs>